Looking cool, Joker. Hey everyone, Andrew here from Beta64. You know what I love? Persona 5, that was smooth. I've been a fan of this game since it released. Picked it up a couple months after it came out, didn't play it for like three years, beat it in six months, and boy, I was ready to make a video. And it was just when Royal was coming out, so I thought, this is the perfect time. There's so much here. Prototype footage, early concept art, scrap mechanics, and over a half an hour of this video is just dedicated to unused findings in the game with some exclusive footage. And if you're afraid about spoilers, don't worry. As long as you have Futaba in your party, you have zero spoilers to worry about from the original game. And if you're still playing through Royal, don't worry, no Royal spoilers at all. So let's sit back, relax, as we talk about the complete developmental history and all those crazy unused findings in Persona 5. The story of Persona 5 begins with a different game, one that you may or may not have heard of. It's Catherine, a puzzle game following the story of a particularly unlikable protagonist trying to climb blocks. Now that doesn't sound all that like Persona 5, does it? Well despite that, Catherine is actually one of the first prototypes of Persona 5. At the beginning, before it was a puzzle game, Catherine was simply being made as a test project by director Katsura Hashino, known for his work on Persona 3 and 4, along with a team of all-star Persona developers like character designer Shigenori Soijima and composer Soji Meguro. They began to work on Catherine while performing the final polishing of Persona 4, so around 2008. This test project was, of course, meant to test things out, like these brand new high-definition graphics, as well as moving around life-size characters realistically, creating events and cutscenes, etc, etc. But what was originally simply a test for the next Persona game suddenly became a highly anticipated game of its own in Japan. Which is great, but, you know, this video's on Persona 5. So let's fast forward after Catherine was released in 2011, when full-on development of Persona 5 would begin. But not until the team that worked on this project was split in two, under the new name P-Studio, with one half working on constantly releasing new titles, and the other half had one sole focus, to create the next big Persona game. The split left them with about 40 people or so, eventually expanding to 70 over the next five years of development. At this point, they would begin using their own personal engine for the game, unlike Catherine, which did make things a lot easier, like creating events, but development was not going to be easy. There was obviously a lot of game to make, but the most challenging part was trying to fulfill their desire to create something new. The jump between Persona 2 and 3 was pretty substantial, but Hashino and his team wanted the jump between 4 and 5 to be even bigger. Actually, it was meant to be more of like a leap into the future of the Persona series. After all, this was the series' 20th anniversary. This was the time to go big. But because of that, this wait was going to be really long. Like, really long. Hashino hoped that fans would be understanding that reveals for this game wouldn't be happening for a while. And he wasn't wrong. It would be over two years before anything was teased about this game other than the occasional, yeah, it's still happening. But during that time, behind the scenes, a lot was going on. So let's take a little look beyond the curtain, shall we? Okay, so during the earliest points of development, there were a lot of ideas being thrown out trying to make Persona 5 unique and different compared to the previous games in the series. One idea was to make it an action-based game instead of a turn-based one, but this was ultimately scrapped. Though technically we would see this kind of battle system later in Persona 5 Scramble, just with a billion enemies at once. Another major change that was considered but they actually went for was the addition of unique palaces, with randomly generated dungeons used in previous games being limited to only mementos. This was done in order to give returning players something unique to experience and hopefully draw in some new players to the series. The decision to bring back shadow negotiations though was to appeal to older fans who felt that negotiations were a key part of the series. And plus, Hashino wanted the Phantom Thieves to be able to hold up their enemies at gunpoint and say, hand over the monies. Classic thievery move. These were all decisions made pretty early on in the game's development, but before they could really get stuff going, Hashino and his co-writers, Shinji Yamamoto and Yuichiro Tanaka, had to come up with the framework of the story. They wanted something different from Persona 3 and 4, deciding that the story of Persona 5 should focus on self-discovery and journey. Now what does that mean? Well, originally it meant that Joker and his pals were going to go backpacking around the world, exploring different countries and, and finding themselves along the way. But then the 2011 earthquake and tsunami happened in Japan, and seeing the Japanese citizens managing to work together and bond through the tragedy, it was beautiful. And in light of that, Hashino decided that Persona 5 should take place solely in Japan, with the journey portion of the game being done through unique palaces, which we mentioned before. After all, you do go through a lot of different locations through them, so it's kind of like you're going around the world. Now, let me ask you. Do you like books? 
Well, Persona 5's story was based on quite a few dusty old novels, and some newer ones, depicting their cutting main characters in a variety of oppressive situations, otherwise known as picaresque fiction. Like the 1554 tale, The Life of Razerio de Tormes, which back then was actually banned by the Spanish crown for being anti-clergy. And then there's Water Margin from 1589, where outlaws managed to join forces and eventually were given freedom from the government. And then there's Ishikawa Goemon, the Japanese equivalent of Robin Hood, who you might remember from one of the test questions you get in Persona 5, which is also where you learn about Arsene, the gentleman thief who eventually became a Persona in the game. Though before Arsene was officially decided to be Joker's Persona, that honor was going to be given to the German demon Mephistopheles. I really hope I said that right. Oh, and by the way, you know Akechi Goro, right? Or Goro Akechi in the English translation. But do you know where his name comes from? Well, I didn't until I researched for this video, and it turns out it comes from another book that helped inspire Persona 5's story, The Fiend with 20 Faces from 1936. In this novel, a detective known as Akechi Kogoro faces off against his arch enemy, the unnamed gentleman thief. So yeah, basically the exact same premise as Persona 5. You might think that's a bit of a cop-out, but to be fair, Akechi has been a used character in well over 50 stories since 1925. Think of it like Sherlock Holmes for Japan, which is used in so much media I literally couldn't count it all. The same goes for Akechi, even though his name was changed a bit from Kogoro to Goro, it's basically the same character that's been used in so many Japanese novels, just now in the Persona universe. These novels that I've mentioned didn't just affect the characters and storyline of the game, it also majorly affected how fusions worked. See, in Persona 3 and 4, fusions were done using cards, but thanks to all that picaresque fiction that the writers had been reading, they decided to make fusion based on capital punishment instead, something that the hero in a picaresque novel would be very well aware of. You know, I guess Persona 5 technically is a picaresque work more or less. The main characters are literally designed as having no place to belong as they attempt to survive within a corrupt society and their work as a Phantom Thief was meant to give them a place to break outside those imposed cultural limits, which in turn makes them enjoy their powers much more than in previous Persona games, where the protagonists were more so dragged into their newfound powers. So that's the basic framework of Persona 5, but now I'd like to focus on some actual concrete changes by comparing some of the earliest test footage that we have of the game. Now this footage was shown off after release, but it demonstrates some of the earliest ideas that the team had during the first couple years of full-time development. So let's take a look, shall we? The first of these short test clips comes from episode 5 of the Persona Stalker Club V Show and shows off Joker carrying a small brown bag while wearing an unbuttoned shirt and tie in a blocky high-rise apartment overlooking Tokyo. Turns out this is where our protagonist originally lived, along with Prosecutor Sai. Yeah, that's right, LeBlanc wasn't Joker's original home, it was Sai's apartment. In the beginning, while trying to track down the Phantom Thieves, unbeknownst to her, she would have been living with their leader, Joker showing him calling cards and discussing plans for capturing them, but in the end, this was all scrapped because Hashino thought it was just too cheesy. We do happen to have footage of the inside of the apartment as well, which was shown off about a year later in 2017. It lets us see some more blocky rooms, an early check pop-up, and oh look, he finally buttoned up his shirt and got the same bag as the final game, just bluer. Also, check out Sai. At this point, she was using Catherine with the K's model from Catherine. <laughs> Seeing as that game was a test for Persona 5, it makes sense for them to reuse models and UI for testing purposes, though the proportions of the characters were eventually changed from what we saw in Catherine to keep the game from looking too realistic, quote unquote. And now onto the last prototype footage we have, which takes place on a train. This build was designed in order to see what it would look like if crowds were grey in order to help important characters stand out, like the two students that Joker is overhearing. This side was scrapped though because, well, it wasn't colorful enough, obviously. Oh, and also Joker's wearing another early outfit here too. And so development went on, and on, and on, with nothing new from the team for two years, other than, yes, we're still working on it, we promise we're working on it, yes, we are working on it. The first time that anything was like actually revealed was on November 21st, 2013. It was just a simple teaser though, there really wasn't anything substantial shown, except for the last bit. So let's take a look at that. Ah yes, releasing 2014 winter. So as you're probably aware, Persona 5 released in Japan on September 15th, 2016, almost two years after the date shown in the announcement trailer. 
And three months after this teaser was shown off in Japan, Persona 5's North American release window was revealed to be in 2015, another two years off, seeing as the game actually released in 2017 in the West. After that, silence. There wasn't much else talked about the game. That is until a new teaser trailer showed up on September 1st, 2014. Everyone was so excited to see this. Look, it's fully animated, and, and there's the new protagonist, and there's the school's logo, and oh freak, there's the game's logo! PS3, right? Uh-huh. PS4? Oh my gosh, I can't wait to play this holiday season of 2014. It was delayed. That was the most hype delay announcement I've ever seen. And a few months after that, in December, it was Atlas USA's turn to tell us it was delayed. And... They didn't, actually, for some reason. They once again restated that Persona 5 was definitely gonna release in North America in 2015. Sure. All right, it's 2015, where's Persona? Well, obviously we didn't get the game, but we did get some other nice stuff this year, like a cool ad in the newspaper, which was the first time that the Phantoms were ever mentioned, along with their logo. And then there was February 5th. That's when the floodgates burst open with our first ever look at Persona 5's intro animation and even better, the gameplay. So yeah, we've definitely got quite a bit to look at here and compare, well, more or less. The intro animation and various other animated cutscenes didn't change all that much. So really, all that's left to compare is the various gameplay segments, and well, there's still a lot of changes in there, so let's take a look, shall we? So the first thing we need to talk about is the date in the footage, April 11th. That's not abnormal, right? There's always a date up there. But the thing is, in the final game, April 11th happens to be the first day of school. That's when you meet up with Ryuji the first time, see on a bit with Kamoshida, and then you end up accidentally barging into Kamoshida's palace, join with Arsene, meet Morgana, escape, catch the last bit of school, it's, it's a long day. But in this trailer, apparently something entirely different happens. Here you get on the train, walk to school, have a normal day of class, though at a different camera angle. Afterwards, you hang out with Ryuji, An, and Morgana, who apparently already know you well, in some graffiti-ridden spot in Tokyo, which might be an early version of the Axis Way in Shibuya. Then in the evening, you all head to LeBlanc to discuss your infiltration of Kamoshida's palace with Metaverse Morgana. Wait, wait, wait. Morgana isn't supposed to look like this unless they're in the Metaverse. But they aren't in the Metaverse in this footage since their feet aren't kicking up any of that weird pink stuff. Though in this version of the game, it does look a bit different, like water ripples. Still, that doesn't happen here, so I guess Morgana could just change freely between cat and metaverse form at first. Or maybe it was just for the trailer. Either way, after that, still on April 11th, mind you, Joker then goes to infiltrate Kamoshida's palace alone, and in the evening no less, according to this kanji, something impossible in the final game. Plus, I didn't even mention this, on Joker's way to school, the train he's on gets shaken violently due to a passing train going way too fast, and that sonic speed train is likely the one that crashes in the final game. But in that version, it happens on April 10th, not the 11th, so I guess that means that it was originally going to happen on the first day of school, with Joker and a train on the next rail over. Wait a second, they're not the same color, are they? Well, frick, either it was in the train, or maybe it was an early color for it? I don't know. And honestly, how the story flows in this trailer, it's super confusing to try to match up with the final game. Which means they either made huge changes for the first few hours of the game's story, definitely a possibility, or that date was just arbitrarily picked for the trailer. Either way, there are plenty more changes to look at in this trailer, especially with the UI. Take a look at this close-up of Ryuji's face. These couple seconds alone have quite a few changes. First off, obviously, it shows a lot more of his face here. Though it turns out, the final game's version of his art is still about the same size, but it's mostly obscured by the outline. Now, it's definitely not the same art. There's different shading, and the final version is missing his neck and nose, which I guess is not that weird since you wouldn't have been able to see it anyway. And speaking of that outline, in the final game it just sort of comes in like a lightning bolt, but this early version had it ripping in like you were ripping paper, along with a different red background. An's close-up does the same thing too, but her art is much more on par with the final game, just a bit different here and there in the details. For the pause screen, the animation that's done when you hit pause is slightly different, mostly with the eye contact. After that it looks pretty much the same except that it says camp and main here instead of menu and main. And also the calendar was originally going to be called Mission in this build, and status, it seems like it would have originally been called Party. This footage also heads into the Equip menu, but the animation looks pretty much the same, the only biggest difference here is Joker's eye. There are a couple places I'd like to take a closer look at in this trailer, like the Doctor's exam room. We can only see it for a split second, but it shows off some really cool things that aren't in the final version. Like an x-ray of a fish, a giant cabinet of various liquids, and radioactive testing equipment along with a hazmat suit. What? Can you, like, 
legally have something like that? Well, I, I guess it doesn't matter because it's all hidden behind a sheet in the final version. They'll never find that, unless you look really close. Over there, you can still faintly see the lights from the machine, but playing the game, I never noticed it, so she's probably good. Okay, one last place, Kamoshida's Palace. To start us off on this, the trailer shows us Joker dropping down to the main hall, where the only difference is here is the painting on the back wall, and even then it's only a slight difference with the arm placement. The chandelier hopping scene didn't change that much either, except for not saying jump. Honestly, for a trailer that was shown well over a year before the game actually released, there isn't much to see in this palace. I'm sure there's some difference with enemy placement or something like that, but really, not a whole lot to look at. Except for with the battles. There are two things shown off here that I want to look at. The first is Bullet Hail, a move that you learn from the Tower Confidant in the final game. But in this, instead of lining up and taking your shots, your party instead surrounds the enemy, like what happens after all enemies are knocked down, allowing you to perform an all-out attack. And speaking of which, an all-out attack was also shown in this trailer too. Check it out! Oh my gosh! That is not Joker's final art. That's, that's scary. Oh my gosh, I do not like that. So that was the first gameplay trailer of Persona 5. There was another trailer that was shown at E3 the same year, but it was actually just the same trailer translated into English. The time between those two trailers though, so February to June, right. A lot of info was released to the public, like the game's setting, the gameplay and how it was laid out, and it was all pretty much the same as the final version. But we did get some screenshots of the game that are very interesting that I think we should take a look at. The first we have is of our Sen in battle, with chains all around him, something you don't normally see in battle since they're like so small in comparison to the screenshot. Not to mention it's only around Joker in the final game, not our Sen, which is cool and all. But this other screenshot showing Joker waiting for his train on April 7th? Now that is really interesting, because the final version of the game starts on April 9th, meaning that this screenshot is from two days before the final game even begins. If this was actually supposed to be and not a placeholder date, then maybe it's not so weird that you would have known Ryuji on and Morgana on the 11th, like we saw in the trailer earlier. And speaking of trailers, it's time to look at the second trailer for Persona 5 that leaked on June 24th, 2015. It was included with the Persona 5 special Blu-ray and features a lot of the same footage from the last trailer, except we do get to see a little bit of the casino from the intro of the game, with a lot of gross placeholder sound effects. Ugh. Also, the shadow that Joker jumps on is wearing a different mask shaped like a heart, and it turns into a different persona in this footage compared to the final game, with Joker fighting it at a different camera angle, showing off a critical with a different font. The music in this trailer is also like a midi-ish sounding version of Last Surprise. It's really weird, and I think we should take a listen to it because that's basically all we have left to see in this trailer. Take a listen. You know, the more I listen to it, the more I actually grow to like it. You know what else I like? In retrospect, when a game is supposed to come out on a certain day, then a leak comes out saying it's gonna be delayed, and then the PR manager is like, no, no, it's definitely gonna come out that day and then it gets delayed. Well, that's exactly what happened to Persona 5. Sony Computer Entertainment of Europe released an advertisement that said it would release in 2016 when it was set to release in 2015. And Atlas USA was like, no. The only thing I can confirm for Persona 5 is a 2015 release. Both the ad and the PR manager were wrong. And fun fact, that same advertisement said that Final Fantasy VII Remake was going to release in 2016. Hello from the year 2020. I still don't have it. Andy from A Plus Start has it. I don't have it. So we're now in September of 2015, and on the 17th of this month, Tokyo Game Show 2015 officially began, with Atlas Booth featuring a small little nod to Persona 5. That same day, Atlas did what they called a business trip stream, where they revealed the Velvet Room attendance, as well as a new promotional trailer. And honestly, there aren't that many big, earth-shattering changes here. Just some interesting ones here and there, like Kaneshiro not being purple in his palace, or the fact that you can visit Shinjuku on April 16th, when in the final game it can only be visited starting on June 18th. 
there's also a guy over there with a car just standing there menacingly. And the signs were changed too, like Bird Trip becoming Second Heaven and Moran Moran. Well, that was originally called New Older. Honestly, there's a lot more signs that we could compare here, but it would take way too long to mention them all. I will say though, the map icons here are white, but they're yellow in the final game, and the same applies in Shibuya, where an early icon of a dog statue thing was replaced with just three blocks. That's a cool change, right? Actually, you know what, forget that. You know what's a really cool change? Originally, your party, when chased in rat form, would put their little arms up in the air as they ran away. Look at them go! Wait a minute, why are there rats in Kamoshida's palace? That doesn't happen until like, way later. Okay, interesting, I'll take note of that. So yeah, that's all we have to look at. Seems to be mostly just polishing up with little changes here and there too. Oh, summer 2016 release, huh? Another delay. But hey, at least this time they were actually right. The game did release on the very tail end of summer 2016 in Japan. Atlas USA also announced a delay saying that the North American release would be pushed back to 2016. Now that one didn't happen, but hey, you know, you got one of two right. That's not so bad. If you were hoping for more interesting info from around this time, not to worry. After the trailer, we got to see a developer interview with Hashino, showing off an in-development build of the game complete with debugging features. It also has the date April 1st on the top corner, which is a day not possible in the final game, but you know, since it was a debug build, this was probably just like a default day for testing purposes. After all, the kanji here says morning, both when you're in school and in the palace, and you can't be in the palace in the morning, so yeah, probably just for testing. When he is in the palace though, we do get to see that the security level meter was planned to be on screen at all times, not just when pressing the third eye button. We also get to see a blue hallway in Kamashita's palace, where it shows off little pop-ups for the places that you could jump to while taking cover, something that was replaced with a light ring marker on the floor in the final version. And not only that, check this out. Briefly, we get to see a removed room where Joker pulls a lever and it moves a bunch of paintings revealing another room. Now, the security meter shows Kamoshida on the screen, but with all those paintings, it seems more like a place that would belong in Madarame's palace. Not to mention, some of the materials used in this room are from Madarame's palace in the final game. So that icon was probably just a placeholder or something. Either way, this room it never made it into the final game, though it is technically still in the game's files as discovered by Panhime. The textures don't look quite right, but it is still technically there, though we are getting a bit ahead of ourselves, aren't we? Let's talk more about unused stuff later. Instead, let's head to the end of 2015. Since September, there's been a lot more interviews, complete with screenshots and other cool tidbits, but to be honest, at this point, it's pretty much all the same as the final. It looks like we're pretty much at the end of Persona 5's development. All that really happened going into 2016 was more info on Ryuji, An, and Morgana, though at this point, Atlas was very, very adamant about not confirming Morgana's gender, even though in the final game, Morgana does state that he is male. The reason for the ambiguity during development may have been because the developers were still trying to decide whether to make his gender concrete or more mysterious. After all, if it wasn't for him specifically saying he's a dude, it really could have gone either way. Like, Morgana is traditionally a female name, and the voice actor is female too. But here's the thing, Morgana was originally designed as a feminine character, and we know this thanks to what was shown in the Persona 5 Official Design Works art book, which was released a few months after Persona 5. As you can see from this concept art, Morgana was definitely going to be a lot more traditionally feminine. Character designer Soijima said he went for what he called a female design at first because a gender for Morgana hadn't been decided on yet. This early artwork showcases a different body style and a rubber suit that covers everything except for the head. This same art page also shows off Morgana's van transformation, which, by the way, was originally going to be a sports car. Morgana was also going to be able to transform into other things as well, basically anything he wanted to, but this idea was scrapped and limited to the van transformation. Oh, and I also want to talk about Morgana's persona, Zoro, who was originally going to be a dog, and then Soijima was like, nah, let's make him a big burly man. In the end though, Soijima decided just to have it resemble a blown up balloon, so that way you wouldn't be able to tell if it's actually strong or not. In other words, he wanted it to be mysterious, much like Morgana. There is so much more to this book than just Morgana though. Oh, I'm sorry. Everyone's here. So let's take a look further in, starting with the Phantom Thieves and some of their earliest thieving outfits. So it turns out originally their thieving outfits were literally just going to be their school uniforms with masks given to them by Morgana. This piece of art in particular is pretty weird because Joker is wearing Skull's mask and Ryuji, well, I guess he's the Joker now. 
Soijima thought they would be way too easy to recognize in these outfits though if they ever ended up, you know, getting caught. So he tried alternate school uniforms like this, but with a skull instead of the school's logo. But that didn't last long either. His next thought was just to have them wear regular clothes, but now they just look like regular criminals. So in the end, he decided to give them distinct romanticized outfits. That way the Phantoms could separate themselves from everyday criminals as well as their student lives. Now, why don't we take a closer look at each of these Phantom Thieves individually? And as you could probably guess, let's start with Joker. The first is of him wielding a gun, but Hashino thought it looked too realistic. So these next couple pieces were made in a much more anime art style. This was ultimately scrapped too, because it was just too anime for their taste. A balance had to be struck with the final design, and in the end, they managed to find a style they liked for both Joker and the rest of the cast. Next up, let's check out Ryuji. Ryuji didn't change all that much. His persona Captain Kid though used to look absolutely terrifying, but that's about it. Now what about Odd? Turns out originally in the metaverse, she was going to be using night vision goggles to look around while wielding a crossbow, but that was later switched to some cooler shades before it was all scrapped, though these goggles were eventually given to Futaba to wear. On was also planned to have a blue headband too that we don't have art of, but that was removed, this time because it apparently made her look like a country girl too much. By the way, interesting little tidbit from the art book here, apparently there was planned to be an event in the game where On would have had her hair down. It was imperative that this scene happened, at least that's what scenario writer Tanaka thought. After all, she normally has her hair up. In his opinion, that meant it had to be shown down at least once. So Soejima decided to draw up this piece of concept art, and uh, Tanaka immediately changed his mind and the scene was never made. Never really explained why. Let's check out Yusuke. At the beginning, he was planned to resemble an art teacher more than an art student with long hair to boot, but that idea was scrapped. He was also planned to attend a school from an earlier Persona game too, but that was also scrapped. And that's about it. Makoto is up next, and I know you were probably hoping that there was going to be a lot about her in this book, after all she is a very popular character but sadly it wasn't meant to be. All the interesting info boils down to that she used to wield two pistols instead of one. Though there is this piece of art, not labeled as Makoto, but was instead placed in the various section of the book. She looks very similar in design, but was carrying a sword and wearing goggles. This could have been an early design for her, but it also could have been just a generic girl character for a generic concept art piece. Either way, let's move on to another one of the more popular Phantom Thieves, Futaba. Did you know that originally she was going to have black hair, but in order to keep her from looking like a stereotypical depressed shutting geek, they decided to have her dye her hair orange. That is canon. Her thief outfit was also designed after outfits in the movie Tron, with the goggles, as I said, taken from on, but redesigned a bit to look more like a frog. Her persona, Necronomicon, was designed to look like a UFO due to Futaba's two Nibio illusions and her love for conspiracy theories. At first, it was gonna fly around inside palaces, but it was just too big, so they had to scrap the idea and just let people assume that's flying somewhere above the palace. Her mom was also mentioned in the art pages too. Turns out at the beginning, she was actually going to force Futaba to become a shut-in before she left. It wasn't Futaba's own choice. She was also planning to be more motherly at first, but they eventually decided to make her look like a researcher who puts work over family. Do not, do not do that. Overall, not so many changes, more like explanations. But Haru, now she changed quite a bit throughout development. In the final game, she's a sweet, strong third year female student, but originally she was going to be male, a first or second year student, depending on where in development you're talking about, but they did both, and she was going to be fluent in the art of classical Japanese dancing, wearing a null mask with her thief outfit. But since they already had a character with a Japanese mask, they decided to scrap this idea. And lastly, we've got Akechi, who looked roughly the same throughout development, except that his thief outfit was originally going to be like a, a cowboy. And he also had this one that looks Kind of cool, not gonna lie. Also, he was planning to be Makoto's brother, but that wasn't an idea worked on for very long. And that's all we got on the Phantom Thieves. Unless. Turns out there was one more Phantom Thief planned during development, and her name was Hifumi, the Shogi player confidant. One of the many people my wife said I should date, but I picked Futaba because, well, I already had the merch. Yeah, Hifumi was originally going to be a Phantom Thief, taking part in the fight against society as the brains of the group. But sadly, it wasn't meant to be, only because the story they had written so far was already just too long. Adding in another Phantom Thief was just going to be too much, so she was simply made a confidant, and the brains of the group role was given to Makoto. Some early concept art shows what she would have looked like in her thieving outfit though, but sadly, it never came to be, even in Royal. There were plans for another Phantom Thief in addition to Hifumi that was going to be a radically minded strategist. 
but once again, the story would be too long, so that character trait was also given to Makoto. And now, with all the Phantom Thieves covered, including the scrap ones, let's check out some other characters that have early concepts in the art book, like Oda without his signature hat. We've also got Iwai looking a lot more gruff, Kawakami looking more generic, Kamoshida looking more gross, and Oya looking cool as heck. What the frick happened to her in her redesign? And we also have what may have been early concept art for the Velvet Room's assistant, if the butterfly means what I think it means. And now on to the final confidant we'll look at, Sai. We mentioned that originally she was going to be living with Joker, right? But did you know one of the other ideas the team had was for her to be Makoto's mother? Here's some art of her when she was planned for that role. Plus, enjoy some other art of her looking just like Bayonetta. Striking resemblance. And now that we finally looked at all of those people, I think we should end our look in the book session with some early pieces of concept art for a few places in the game. Like the Velvet Room, complete with a very intimidating warden and bloodthirsty dog. As well as this one with an aquarium in the back. Much more relaxing. We've also got mementos, but with skulls, and a terrifying depiction of Kamoshida's palace. Like, oh my gosh. I'm getting some serious corpse party vibes. I need to get that off the screen. I'm getting flashbacks. What are we like? Halfway done with the video? Cool. That means all the rest of this is on unused findings in Persona 5. This game is a mess. There are so many unused findings for Persona 5 all over the place. Most of it isn't even documented on the cutting room floor just because it would take so long to write it all up. Luckily, I got help from data mining expert Panhime, who gave me exclusive footage to show you here today. So why don't we get started on the unused findings in Persona 5. In the final game, if you've played it like at all, you know that by doing various things, you can increase Joker's stats like knowledge, guts, proficiency, kindness, and charm. But there's some unused texts that refer to these by different names and even some that were scrapped. We've got Sex Appeal, which may have originally been Charm, and the rest of them I can't really find any final skills to match up with them very well, but they still could technically be early names. We've got one called Cleverness, a social stat that you would raise by organizing magazines without knocking them over, Perception, which you'd rank up by reading manga with Ryuji, then we've got Self-Respect, Quick-Wittedness, Cleverness, and the last of which, Dignity, which you would have increased by cleaning your room and your toilet. Yep, originally there was even going to be toilet maintenance in this game. Not only that, after cleaning your room for dignity points, the text begins to talk about buying furniture and a bed for Morgana. But Morgana always sleeps with you in the final game, and you can't buy any furniture, so yeah, that didn't happen. Even though, according to some other unused texts, and even some unused models, which I'll show you right now, you could have originally customized your sofa, your sheets, your lamp, rug, cat bed, and more. Kinda sad to be honest, I really would've liked this feature. You can technically still customize things by placing out confidant gifts, which are fine, but it used to be so much more. Also, by the way, there are three unused confidant gifts that you could've received. Nice. And speaking of confidants, you know that when forming contracts with them, you get this long speech about I am thou and thou art I. Well, guess what? That wasn't originally going to happen at all at first. Instead, it would have just been a couple lines from Igor saying, you have agreed to a new contract. Excellent. But that's not all. We can actually see this in action thanks to a scrap cutscene that's still in the game's files. It's an alternate version of Mishima's contract forming scene, complete with a different transition to Sai's interrogation. Just takes a, takes a minute. Oh. There he is, here we go. And then bam, there's Igor. Just as quick as he comes though, he leaves. What's even better is that there's no music or voices or anything in this whole event. It's literally just this. There's also some more unused text, which gives us early names of some of the confidants. Yuki Mishima was originally Taichi Nishina, Tai Takami was originally Akimi Gunji, and Munahisa Iwai, who was originally Kaoru Hatakeyama, which is interesting because his son in the game is named Kaoru, which must have come from this early name. There's also a listing for a foreigner confidant too, which didn't make it in, as well as a world confidant that has text for each time that they ranked up. In the final game, ranking up the world confidant is impossible because there technically isn't one. But according to this text, you could have ranked them up from one all the way to max rank, meaning that you would have unlocked the most powerful persona of the word arcana, dummy. Yes, that is what it says. The reason being is that there is no persona in the world arcana in Persona 5 original, that is. You can actually fuse one in Royal, but even so, there is no World Confidant. That wasn't the only thing that Royal added back in the game that was previously unused. It also added in two unused calendar events that are only referenced via text in the original game's files. 
That would be the camping trip and the New Year's shrine visit. Sadly, the Shujin founding anniversary wasn't added in, so that one remains unused. And also with the calendar comes some more unused text, this time for scrapped part-time jobs. Like in the jewelry store, as a barker, and apparently helping with the election during the day in Shinjuku was a job you could have originally been paid for. Some other text also references working at the karaoke bar, as well as as a cram school tutor, where you could have originally earned points for another scrapped social stat, Insight. Oh, and on the subject of social stats, according to some other removed text, you needed to originally have a high level of guts to check out the shops in Ginza. Yes, I said shops. Multiple. Because apparently there used to be more there than just the sushi shop, and you could have originally visited them at any time via the train system. Though it doesn't look like you would have actually been able to walk around Ginza yourself. Just whenever you ride the train there, Morgana would ask you if you want to visit the luxury sushi restaurant or the luxury jewelry store, both of which needed a high level of guts to enter. Not to mention, according to some other unused texts, apparently you needed a high level of guts just to get outside at night in general. Specifically, you needed it at nerves of steel level, which may have been bold level since in the final game, Sojiro gives you permission to go out relatively early on, and getting bold in guts happens pretty early on too. The reason you needed higher guts was because, well, you were scared. The city's dangerous. You gotta train yourself to protect yourself. And on that note, did you know you could have originally trained your marksmanship in Persona 5? As evidenced by a scrap conversation with An Duji Yusuke Morgana talking about trick shooting. And after deciding that you're the only one with a gun that would be good enough for cool trick shooting, you were tasked with finding a place to improve your precision so that you would have a better chance of hitting enemy vitals and immobilizing them. In other words, I'm assuming that means that you would have trained your shooting skills for an increased chance of critical hits when firing your gun, but that idea and the place to do it at were both scrapped. You know what else was scrapped? A CD player. You can technically still purchase CDs in the final game, but those are for gifting. At first though, they were meant for your room's CD player, where they could have been used to play music while training, which in turn made workouts more effective. But it wasn't as easy as just buying a CD player and some CDs. You'd have to start with a broken system, then fix it up before you could use it. But after you do all that, it could be used to replace the normal music track in your room with whatever you wanted. Something like this was added to Royal in the Thieves' Den, but this scrap one was meant for your room in LeBlanc. Now here's a little interesting, more or less random tidbit that I wanted to bring up before we get into the really interesting parts. In the final game, when your party members do a follow-up attack in battle, they're actually using specific skills based on their weapons that you can't see in-game. Like Follow Whip, or Follow Knuckle, or in Morgana's case, Follow Claw. Meaning that perhaps Morgana was originally going to use his claws to fight, much like Teddy in Persona 4. Okay, so on to that really interesting thing. It's particularly spoilery, so if you've never played the original game, feel free to skip to this timecode, or if you're on mobile, tap five times. All right, let's go. So you know that when you're doing shadow negotiations, a lot of the time they'll refer to the palace owner, right? Well, it turns out there's some unused text for those, this time referring to Lord Akechi or Master Akechi. There's not just some though, there's actually lots of references to Lord Akechi. So that could mean that Akechi originally had a palace. Not to mention Sai's palace is considered palace number 57 and Shido's is considered 59. Makes you wonder what number 58 was supposed to be. Likely Akechi. Meaning that you would have had a Faces palace right after the casino, but right before the cruise ship. Or you know, maybe there was no cruise ship originally. Maybe Akechi was the final palace. Either way, this is only found in the game in text form. There's no assets at all for this mysterious scrap palace. Well, hey there, welcome back. We were just talking about palace stuff. Speaking of which, according to some text, you could have originally infiltrated palaces at night. Something impossible to do in the final game. Which reminds me, didn't we see footage of that in one of the teasers earlier? Joker then goes to infiltrate Kamoshida's palace alone, and in the evening, no less. Ah, uh, yeah. So yeah, apparently that was going to be a thing. And speaking of things that were going to be, like, a thing, let me tell you about After School Chase. So according to this unused text for a tutorial on something called After School Chase, Kamoshida and his volleyball team, Goons, were going to be looking for you and chasing you after school, and if you weren't sneaky enough, you could be caught and detained until nighttime. A strange little gameplay scene to be sure, that's definitely not in the final game. You could have also used the L1 button to figure out who was after you, meaning that the goons were probably blending in with the other students. And you could also use the Phantom Thief skill known as Stealth to dash around with the R1 button, something that evolved into the cover and dash mechanic that was used with the X button in the final version. 
There's also another scene possibly related to this in unused text form, which is about Joker attempting to search the school faculty office for Kamoshida's medal. This scene is slightly restored thanks to Panhime with an exam prompt where you would have found the medal. Sadly, in this restored scene, that text that we talked about earlier is not here, and there's no proof that it's connected to the after-school chase gameplay. Still though, it's interesting nonetheless. Alright, next thing we need to talk about are unused graphics, but before we get to that, I want to talk about some used graphics in the Persona 5 weapon.pack file, which teaches us some of the early code names for the Phantom Thieves, like how Skull was originally called Reaper, or how Panther was originally called Papillon, and Crow, well he was Karasu, which is hilarious because it turns out there's a scene in the final game where Akechi wants to be called Karasu, and all the Phantom Thieves are like, no, you're gonna be called Crow. I wonder if that actually happened to one of the game developers like while he was pitching the name. That would be hilarious. There's also one more interesting thing in the weapon.pack file. All the code names are matched up with sprites for their corresponding arcana. And it turns out the strength arcana is matched up with blank. Literally a character called blank. But it's in the same place that Haru is, which means Haru may have originally been part of the strength arcana instead of the empress one. All right, I won't keep you waiting any longer. Let's check out some unused graphics inside of Persona 5. To start, let's check out these early portraits of Ryuji that we've technically already seen from the 2015 trailer. This art style is definitely unique, not quite the same as the final version, and it turns out more character portraits have this same early art style, like On, but peeved off. Heck, even in her early neutral portraits she still looks a bit upset. There's also tons of frames for Joker, who doesn't have any conversation portraits in the final game, like, at all, so there's nothing really to compare it to. Also check out Morgana. Jeez Louise, that is one smug boy. I hate to break it to you though, but technically the same pose is used in the final game, just cut off. So really the biggest change is just how much body there is, since it was designed as a talking portrait, not just a cut in. The rest of these portraits also didn't really go through that many changes except for the art style. We got Yusuke over here, looking good as always. Makoto, still looking very serious, that's normal. And we've even got Mishima here too. This one's a bit different with him lowering his head when he's upset. That doesn't happen in the final game. But we're not done yet, we've got even more portraits just in a different art style from the 2015 ones. Like angry Ryuji, looking very anime. And then there's some more of him too that seem like a mix between the 2015 and final version's art style, both in normal clothes and in his Phantom Thief outfit. Now what about unused expressions based on the final portraits? See, to keep from having to redraw every frame of animation, sometimes the game will do like a paste of different expressions over finished portraits. So let's see what we got here. There's a couple of interesting ones like Blushing Ryuji, very cute. And then we got Yusuke. I, I don't know what I would have done to make this appear in game, but I'm already sorry. Other than that, we've also got some unused portraits of Ishiki, as well as some of Shadow Kaneshiro, which is pretty much the same as the final version, just not purple. Something that we already knew thanks to the 2015 trailer of the game. There's also some more spoilery portraits to show for just a brief second. So if you want to remain spoiler free for the original game, just tap the right side of your screen two times. Or if you're on desktop, skip to this time here. Great. So here's Akechi, after being defeated, but smiling. These expressions are so unused that it doesn't even appear in the PS4 version's files. We've also got him panicking, that was also never seen, plus some uncomfy close-ups of what is likely Akechi's cognitive doppelganger in Shido's palace. All right, for those who tuned out, welcome back. Next thing we'll look at are some unused UI graphics, like this break time prompt that happens to be in the files for the hideout and safe rooms. Perhaps meant as like a button for you to press to reheal, though we're not quite sure. There's also this removed L3 command for disguising and canceling. No one had any idea what this meant, but as I was revising the script, Panhime made an amazing discovery. She found this meter labeled as Hensel or disguise in English. It looks to be a meter that fills up to limit how long you could stay disguised. Plus, she also found this unused text for the art showcase that Mararame is at, which suggests you would have had to disguise yourself as a handsome man in order to snoop on him. Apparently, this text was around when the game was in alpha form, as suggested by the text itself. Basically, you would have had to press L3 to disguise yourself as a fancy gentleman in the art showcase to get up close to Mararame. Sounds a lot like when you had to sneak around for Kamashita's medal, huh? Seems like you would have had to do a lot more sneaking around in the real world before it was just all up and scrapped. Now check this out. These graphics are from the PS3 version of the game exclusively. Basically, this is how it would look like. The animated portraits would be in the cutouts with the text executing nearby or struggling with the red portraits. 
Its file name helps us a bit in trying to figure out what its purpose is. It's called Sakusen, which means tactics, strategy, or operation. So perhaps it was meant to show up when giving orders to your teammates in battle, but was ultimately scrapped in the end. Honestly, I don't know, but you can see these same portraits in other unused graphics with the text Mission Technic Skill Up, which was probably supposed to read as Mission Technique, but that's fine. There's also one more of these two with just a random dude's silhouette. Likely, this was just a placeholder though. And speaking of placeholders, here's one for all out attacks that says, let's fire. The kanji there, by the way, means temporary. So yeah, it's definitely placeholder. You'll see this kanji on some other stuff too, like this placeholder calling card, featuring a very different Phantom Thieves logo. The Japanese text was translated on the cutting room floor, but there were some liberties taken with it. So I decided to translate it myself for a more direct translation. At the time I appear, the countdown to despair will begin. At the time the clock points to zero, peace will be in the past. Ordinary life will not return. To all the detectives, let's begin the game. The fan thieves. Very ominous, wouldn't you say? Once again, this card was only meant to be temporary, as you can see by the kanji, but gosh, it sounds so cool. There's plenty more placeholder graphics where that came from, like this one for confidant rank ups, finding a safe room, getting a new mission, and one that was probably for deadlines. It says tutorial on it, but also firm date. So maybe a deadline for tutorial, or a tutorial about deadlines. We also happen to have a placeholder background for flashbacks in the student council room, with no shadows, just some ambient inclusion. And that's not all. We got plenty of placeholder flashbacks, more than just backgrounds, most of which have edit mode on the bottom right, or another one of those temp kanji watermarks. Most of them also use generic poses for the character, who are almost always wearing their winter uniforms no matter what time of year or location. Also check this out, the date here happens to be April 1st, an impossible date in the final game. And remember, that's not the first time we've seen it, that impossible date was also in the debug build that Hashino showed us. So likely, this was the default date for debug and edit mode, seeing as it appears twice in totally different time points in the story. Also fun fact, if you look closely at this flashback here, see that? It's a Mac cursor, meaning that Persona 5's edit mode was probably being run on an Apple computer. There's just a couple placeholder stuff left for us to look at in the graphics department, like these poster-like things that are only found in the PS4 version of the game. One says get XP, and the other one shows Joker, his current rank, and a spot for XP to be listed out, meaning this was likely for the party menu, where it shows how much XP is left before leveling up. Also, check out this early save icon, which could be an early version, or maybe a placeholder. Either way, it's never used. The name cards that appear when you walk into shops and such also have a bunch that were never used for various reasons, like Joker not being able to walk into them in the final game, or some just simply use a different image. There are two exceptions though. The first is for a sports store, which is not in the game at all, and the other is for Miyashita Park. It's a real location in Shibuya, but it's not in Persona 5. Nothing exists for either of these places in the files though, all we have are the name cards. Speaking of cards, you know how all the confidants in the game are based around different tarot cards, right? Well, it turns out there's some unused variants of them being reversed or shot. And I think now's the time to tell you how Persona 5 was originally going to be way more stressful of a game. So if you play Persona 3 or even 4, you probably know what these images represent. In those games, if you didn't meet up with certain social links for a while or cancel plans or did generally bad stuff, your link to them could become reversed or even break. And thanks to those unused graphics and a lot of unused data, we now know that this stressful little feature, labeled as doubt instead of reversed, was planned to be in Persona 5 for all non-playable confidants, with the exception of Mishima, Carolina Justine, Sojiro, and Sai, since there are no images for their cards. Though they do appear in unused dialogue as being possible to reverse, so it's like, at first everyone was planned, then they limited it a bit for the images, before it was all completely scrapped. So let's check out some of that unused dialogue, like this one from Morgana explaining a bit on how it all works. And there are plenty more unused pieces of text that happens if you do decline that invitation. Chihaya would ask you if you stop believing in her fortune telling, Takemi would wonder if you're ignoring her text because you think she's annoying, and Hifumi, well she just straight up pulls out the this always happens to me, I always drive people away card. Like heck, I already feel bad enough for getting to respond to someone in real life, I don't need these in my game too. Frick, they've even got text when you ignore their phone calls, which by the way includes Sai and Akechi, meaning that they were not automatic confidants at first. Now some of these doubt events are still in the game's files by the way, showing exactly what would have happened if you just happened to say the wrong thing and make them doubt you. 
Like for Yoshida, not being able to remember Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous quote, well, that's a freaking deal breaker. There's no way you really want to be a politician, which, I mean, you don't, so I, I guess he is right. Well, anyway, after this cool little animation, you get some not-so-cool news. You've lost all of your confidant benefits. Like for Chihaya, no more fortune-telling. Or for Takemi, no more medicine. Not to mention you won't get any extra XP from Arcana Burst. It's pretty freaking rough. Luckily, you can lift this doubt by proving that you're not a suspicious person. Like for Kawakami, you would have to prove to her that you haven't been hanging around any other girl. Girls. Okay, but if you decide to continually ignore them, they will become broken. And when that happens, you won't be able to talk to them anymore. Jeez Louise. Honestly, I'm really glad this ever made it in. I do not need any more of this kind of pressure in my life. And hey, you know what? Speaking of pressure, let's talk about the security meters you find in palaces, or more specifically, unused graphics for the characters on those security meters. The first one we've got is of normal Kamoshida, which you would think would be in the final game, but no, by the time the security meter shows up, you've already seen his shadow form making the normal Kamoshida impossible to see on the meter. The next one we've got is of Shadow Futaba, which once again you'd think would be in the final game, but no, even after you see Shadow Futaba, the meter only shows normal Futaba, no matter what. Which leads us to the last unused meter character, Futaba's mom, we think. I mean, it looks like her, though for some reason it's listed as the last of all the security meter characters with the name Danger Care 1. And you know, since we're on the subject of palaces, there's a ton of unused and early maps in the game. And by that I mean like map maps, like the HUD kind, though there are a lot of placeholder maps for the close-ups that appear when collecting them. Some of these early HUD maps even have early styles to them, like from Madarame's palace, though basically the main difference is that it's very gray. Layout-wise though, this main room was definitely expanded later on, and inversely, the safe room here has shrunk some. I mean, assuming that is a safe room. That map along with this one that's in the same early style, and this one which is closer to the final but not quite, also happen to come with some early markers that go unused, like an S for safe room, down for stairs, yeah, they're pretty self-explanatory. There happen to be even more, even earlier styles of HUD maps, all from Madarame's palace by the way. And here's the first of them. Yeah, it's a map on an iPhone, with the text Another World Navi on the status bar. Notice how the map has some kind of like, crosshair thing on it? That may have been a 3D move, rotate, and scale tool, meaning that this is just a zoomed out screenshot of a 3D modeled hallway, untextured no less, pasted on an iPhone with a P over the home button. In other words, it is definitely a mock-up that never saw the light of day. The other map idea kind of saw the light of day, but not for palaces, only mementos. It's a map made out of pieces of hallways and rooms that are put on a grid via an algorithm. These pieces are actually for the garden in Madarame's palace, but in the end, it just uses a nice, stylized, handmade map. Madarame isn't the only one who's got unused maps, though. Far from it. Kamoshida also has a very interesting early map in the game's files. It's hard to compare side by side given that there are three maps for a three-story castle. To help, we can think of it this way. The first floor of the early map is basically just the first floor and right half of the second floor from the final game squished together. And the early second floor included the left half of the final second floor plus the left half of the third floor. Following this so far? Awesome. Here we can see some removed rooms like this one, that's just an empty space in the final map, and a couple other places that because of their size were probably safe rooms. And that's Kamashita's map. Confusing, big, and a whole lot to talk about. Same thing applies to its scrap rooms, ones where we can actually walk around, though some are more unfinished than others. Like this room, which is attached to a test area for palaces that uses Kamashito's main hall as a base. Now if we compare the main hall itself, it looks pretty much the same as the final, except for a few small things like a cabinet here where there was supposed to be a bookcase. But that's not what I want to focus on. I want us to check out this room, except that we can't because the model for it is gone. It would have been over here, but sadly we only have collision for it, which is why this render is so blocky. The interesting thing is that it actually resembles this removed room in the early map that we literally just finished comparing. But since it's only collision, there's not much more that we can look at. So let's move on to all of these scrap places for Kamashita's palace. First we got an area full of gates and crates, some of which look like they were designed to help jump over the gates, leading to more gates. There's something similar in this next room, which has a big box meant to be used to climb on this ledge, which leads you to really nothing much. Next up is a pathway with three broken bridges, which is no trouble. You can easily jump over all of them. And the next stop on our journey is this elevator room, which has a nice attached dining area. Very nice. The rest of it though isn't quite as nice. Now what about this curved pathway with an oil slick in the middle? 
Now I don't think it was actually supposed to look like this, but still, it's kind of cool looking, not gonna lie. And then we've got this puzzle room that was meant for the rat transformation with plenty of cells to look through. It's different from the one that we saw in the trailer, meaning that there were likely two rat puzzles playing for Kamoshida's palace. And that's not all. Next up is this gym, which was designed for, you know, torturing students, is big really big and resembles the smaller area in the final game where Ryuji takes notes of student names called the training hall of love and next up here we've got a bunch of prison cells with students in each one though in this they're actually all part of the level geometry for some reason so they don't have any animations there's even more cells in another scrapped area but with no prisoners in them pretty much all of these scrapped cells have chalkboards in front of them that were completely removed from the final game for whatever reason there's also an area with a bunch of students suspended in cages over a water pit, shown off from this really neat camera angle at least. You would have been able to reach this place via elevator, as you can see here. Sick. There's one last unused place we'll look at in Kamoshida's palace, the sewer. It features even more cages over water as well as various other rooms around it, one of which features spikes coming out of the ceiling that would have likely crushed the player. Turns out this main room was actually added back into Royal as a place to hold one of the will seats. Though, I won't say how to get there, because that would be a spoiler. Now, I know we've been talking quite a bit about Kamoshida, but don't worry, there's plenty of unused areas for other palaces too, like this early money laundering office for Kaneshiro's palace, complete with a locked camera, basically turning it into like a, like a 2.5D side-scrolling segment. There's also multiple places to climb up and drop below to hide from patrolling shadows. It's pretty cool to be honest. Futaba's palace also has an early unused corridor called Underground Passage. It's not much, very blocky, and the doors only lead you to walls, so yeah, other than the two shadows, there's not much here. But now here's something really cool. Think back to the earliest gameplay trailer that feels like forever ago. Turns out some of the places in here that don't appear in the final game can still be found in its files. For instance, this train, which we saw from this scene in the trailer. Now because in order to get this thing to work again, it's kind of plopped into the game, we can walk around the train, though it's clear that you were not supposed to, as evidenced by the camera clipping through the advertisements. But that's not all. We've also got this area from the trailer, a scrap meetup spot for the Phantom Thieves. So now that we can walk around it, let's take a look at this place in more detail. Though there isn't a whole lot of detail to see, since there was definitely a reason why the trailer only had two fixed camera angles. It's because, like, heck, there aren't even any buildings in the background for the city itself, since it would have been outside the camera's view anyway. There's still some cool stuff to see around here, like Melty the Donut Shop, some ambulances, and a cool little area with an art piece in the center. Very nice. Alright, next thing I want to look at are unused events, some of which are translated, some of which are dubbed, but all of which are unused. And there are quite a lot of them. Some are more interesting than others, so I think we should take a look at some of the best that Persona 5 has to offer. First, let's think back to the intro of the game in the casino. You know how Joker bursts through the window while cool and whatnot, and then almost immediately gets caught and handcuffed? Of course you remember that. But that's not how it was originally going to go. See, in this unused cutscene, which was actually dubbed by the English voice actors, but doesn't come with any translated text, Joker is told to hide and escape from the police after crashing through the window, being advised to walk along the walls and distract police officers along the way, so that way others can escape meaning that there may have been even more gameplay in the intro after that sick window crashing animation. This next unused cutscene shows what would have happened after that unused event we just looked at, where Joker pulls out his gun with police sirens in the background, then right as the searchlight hits him, bam, he fires the gun, revealing that he's floating. Now after that cutscene, we get to look at this unused room, which shows the outside of the casino, sirens blaring, things happening while Joker runs away to the hideout. It's fully playable and you can run around, but that's really all that is here. Alright, next up is an unused event from after Joker and Ryuji escape Kamoshida's palace for the first time. Remember how they escaped the castle via a vent in the metaverse? Well, according to this cutscene, that happened in the real world, leaving behind a school bag as evidence that Kamoshida discovers after snooping around. Meaning that either the escape point from the metaverse dropped them through the vent and then they dropped the bag, or another option is that the metaverse and the real world were originally connected in such a way that would cause certain things to affect the real world. Also, maybe Joker and Ryuji were actually going through air vents or something and fell out leaving a bag. Either way, it's amazing what implications a 40 second cutscene has on the game's world and storyline. Okay, moving on, let's do a little rapid fire on some less interesting cutscenes to look at. Like Sojiro asking if you're interested in group dating, or if you want to get a part-time job, 
There's even one of the principal telling Kamushita in the faculty room that they've got to accept students like Joker with, with a warm and open heart. Interesting thing for the principal to say, but okay. Now here's something super interesting, but it's spoilery for sure, so you know the deal. Here's the time code, tap three times, and it will pass. For those of you who are ready to go, let's do this. So this is a game over sequence completely removed from the final version. It was likely going to play if you didn't manage to complete Shido's palace in time, something that's actually impossible in the final game since it forces you to go in before it's too late. The dialogue mentions Joker being chosen by God and thusly must be protected by the police. After all, it states that the world is about to end very soon, and then that's it. Game over. Well, hey there, welcome back! All right, everyone, it's time to take five for lunch. And by that, I mean, originally in Persona 5, you could invite people during lunch break to the school's cafeteria via this scrapped event, where you'd walk to the cafeteria, Morgana tells you to invite someone, you pick who you want, call them up, and there you go, you're eating together. After a quick chat in the unused cafeteria, you leave. That's it. No points for your confidence or anything, though it was probably likely intended to happen. Apparently, you could have also gone in off hours to get a bite to eat by purchasing a meal ticket and showing it off to Yoshida, the, I mean, the server lady. That's what it says right there. After that, you eat. And that's it. Nothing happens. <laughs> Once again, there was probably a purpose to all this, but sadly, it's not there. Next up, unused voice clips. There are a mountain of them unused in the game, and I'd just like to look at a few of the most interesting ones, like Joker announcing every single day of the week. It likely would have been playing when he went to sleep in that transition between day and night, and it was probably removed because, like, could get old really fast. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There are also lines for every single confidant in the game, excluding the twins, saying, let me explain. 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 Now, a few of these lines actually give us a small glimpse into some game design choices that were scrapped, like these from Morgana. Let me explain. They would have been playing at the beginning with the first battle tutorials and explained that baton passes would have been available from the very beginning, not a confidant reward. I'm entrusting you with this chance to attack again. No need to hold back. Go for it! Also, apparently Saya would have asked you in a very roundabout way what difficulty you want to play on, something that's only picked by menu in the final game. Can someone's heart be stolen so easily, even if you're untrained? You sound rather composed about it. Easy. Normal, hmm? I see. Well, it would be problematic if it were easy. Do you mean that you risked your life to steal them? I see. Then you admit to doing so. All right, the last voice clip I want to mention isn't even in Persona 5. It's in Persona 4 Arena Ultimax, and it's of the announcer introducing a new fighter, Persona 5 Hero, along with his persona, Mephistopheles. Which, actually, the announcer pronounces it Mephistopheles, Mephistopheles, or something like that. Which means I got it wrong when I mentioned it the first time. But it is Joker's original persona. P5 Hero. Persona 5 Hero. Mephistopheles. Okay, we've looked at unused text, graphics, areas, events, voice clips. I don't even have enough fingers to talk about it. Because, wait, actually I do. Now we're going to talk about unused models in the game. And most, if not all, are very interesting. So let's start with, as you can probably guess, Kamoshida's Palace. First off, remember the two-sided portrait in the main hall? Well, it looks like originally it would have been a two-sided wall that rotated along with an early portrait of Kamoshida. Though, it's actually cut off. Here's what the painting looks like in its full glory. And speaking of the eternal never-ending glory of Kamoshida, here's a scrap bust of him, which you can bust open for treasure. It also happens to be in that test room that we briefly talked about earlier. And when using Joker's third eye, it appears as blue instead of gold, which is the color that's shown for all the other searchable, bustable objects in the game. The only ones that show blue are like the two-sided wall, so maybe this bust was just special. Kamoshida's Palace also has some scrap volleyball players, which are blocky stick people, so yeah, placeholder. And then there's this thing with a moving eye, as well as a couple more discretion advised kind of things. There's an unused poster that was meant for the hidden library room, as it matches up perfectly with these pins. And then there's also a bed with a lot of team members on it. You know, if you want to see them, they're on the cutting room floor. But for now, let's head on over to Madarame's Palace, where there happens to be some unused paintings, one of which is animated, 
and this other one was meant to trick players into thinking it was a real passageway. Except that it looks nothing like a real passageway in the palace, so it was likely made from a long while ago, back when the palace looked like that. And then there's this angel that comes with laser heat vision. Yeah, I don't know where this was meant to be, but it's labeled as part of Madarami's palace, so sure. Next up, Kaneshiro's palace. Literally. Here's the entire palace as you would have seen it from the ground. It's untextured and definitely placeholder, much like this slightly untextured keypad that would have been in the bank. Futaba's palace also has a placeholder object too, a sarcophagus that can bust open pretty forcefully. Likely it would have contained a shadow in it, much like the final version does, though that one doesn't burst out. The casino also has a bunch of placeholder objects too, like this card wall that still has a watermark on it for pick stuff. There's even another early version of this card wall that isn't watermarked, but it's still very unfinished. There's some other miscellaneous untextured objects in the game's files as well, like guns and knives. This gun and this knife were meant as placeholders for Futaba, who in the original game never fights, only acting as a navigator. This knife was meant to stab a map in Kamoshiro's palace, but that never happens, as you simply get a big piece of art showing up on the screen whenever picking up a map. And lastly, this gun has the kanji for left above it, which is interesting because Joker only holds a gun in his right hand. In fact, everyone is right-handed except for Akechi. Maybe this was meant as a, like, placeholder for him. Or maybe you could have originally dual-wielded guns. We already saw that there was a plan for Makoto to do it, so it wouldn't be out of the question. We've got some other stuff too here that's a bit more random, i.e. I couldn't figure out a good transition to it, like a treasure chest that can close, which never happens in the final game, surprisingly. And then there's also this lockpick model, complete with animations, which likely means that there was going to be a scrapped minigame where you would actually have to use your lockpick to pick the chest lock instead of Joker just doing it automatically. And speaking of Joker, here's him doing this face. Very anime. And here's a catchy as a rat. So that was all really interesting, right? Well, prepare yourself, because we're gonna look at some really, really interesting unused models, and it all starts with this one of Morgana, and an unused brown bag. It's only a little bit different from the final game. It's more, I'd say, realistic in a way, but that doesn't even compare to what we're gonna look at next, our earliest Morgana. So this is it, realistic Morgana, who happens to be wearing his metaverse scarf instead of a collar. Remember how I said a while ago that when the development team was working off of Catherine, the proportion of the characters were changed in order to keep them from looking too realistic? Well, this may have been from back when that was a thing, along with this model of Joker. It's got a much more realistic-ish look to it, and appears to be a mix of the models used in that early testing footage. It's got the unbuttoned shirt from this one, and the bluer bag around one shoulder from this one. Though this unused model doesn't include glasses, something that is seen in both of these prototypes. Also, for some reason, they switch which side the buttons are on in the uniforms, which you can see better when comparing Ryuji's early and final models. An pretty much looks the same, but has a messier hair and shorter skirt. And then there's Sojiro. Wow, that is some vibrant colors, man! Since they just seem to be solid colors, I'm assuming they were meant as placeholders. Also, his posture was much better in the early model. Don't slack on your posture, it's important. But one character changed more than all of the others, and that is Yoshida. He looks pretty much like a completely different person. The sash he has on says Taro Oyamada, which is one of the more generic Japanese names out there, almost like saying John Smith in English. And the kanji down there basically says to remove bad government. This is probably the most generic politician ever, and was very likely a placeholder. We're not done yet though, there's some even earlier unused models that are much stranger. For instance, here's an untextured model featuring Joker on an electric chair, with the only animation being having the lever pulled. Kinda creepy. And then there's this girl, also untextured. She's just found randomly inside the model for the buildings where Shido gives his speech in Yoganjaya, which, by the way, can't be seen in the game due to the camera angle. Which is probably a good thing, seeing as one of the buildings is McDonald's. Wait, I don't think they were allowed to do that. Anyway, this girl is called Test Size and is roughly the same size as most of the characters in Persona 5, meaning that it was likely just used as a reference when sizing objects in the world. But if that's the case, why is it such a complex model? Couldn't they have just used like a block or a stick figure? Well, the reason for that may be that she was originally a planned character for the game, as evidenced by this piece of concept art we saw earlier. There she is, inside Sports Car Morgana with likely an early version of Joker. Was she going to be a party member? Or maybe she was just drawn for fun? Either way, someone did spend a good chunk of their time modeling her, so she must have been important to someone. But as of now, 
We don't know who she is or what her purpose was. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Hey, it's Encard Andrew here. Panhime, thank you so much for helping with this episode of getting all the footage and explaining all that unused stuff. Mystic Distance for your fact-checking, thank you so much. Members of the Beta64 Discord server, thanks for just being amazing fans. Patrons, thanks for your consistent support. And viewers, thank you for watching. I hope you have an amazing day.